Hello and welcome to Paiju's Exam Prep IAS. Before we begin today's daily quiz, there are a couple of important announcements. First, there is a workshop on the 10th of April 2022 taken by Mukesh sir, where he will be discussing the best tips to prepare for the Civil Services 2023. If you are someone who is preparing for the 2023 IAS examination and wants to know the best way forward, do sign up for this workshop. The link to register is given in the description of this video. It's a one-hour workshop and it starts at 11 a.m. on the 10th of April. Second. The topic for this week's explained session that goes live on our YouTube channel every Friday at 8 p.m. is decoding the criminal procedure identification bill of 2022. Do join us for that where we will be discussing each and every provision of the bill. Why is it being debated across the country and why is it changing the older law? Now let's get back to our daily quiz. Question number one. With reference to the recently passed Dam Safety Act 2021, consider the following statements. Number one, water is a state subject as per the provision of the seventh schedule of the Indian Constitution. Second, the National Committee on Dam Safety will be constituted and will be chaired by the chairperson of Central Water Commission. Third, the owners of the specified dams are required to provide a dam safety unit in each dam. Which of these given statements is or are correct? The correct answer is D. All the three given statements about the Dam Safety Act of 2021 are correct. The reason why this law is in the news is because of the ongoing dispute between Kerala and Tamil Nadu, especially with respect to the Mula Pariyar Dam. The Union Ministry of Jal Shakti has finally established the National Dam Safety Authority, which had to be established under this particular law. This National Dam Safety Authority is a regulatory body to implement the policies and address unresolved issues between the two states. One of the reasons why this bill was required was that a lot of dams in India are now very old and are susceptible to damages. So before any untoward incident happens in these dams, it is important to have a body that can regulate the safety features of such dams. Question number two, consider the following statements with regards to climate change. Number one. The global average temperatures have already risen about 1.1 degrees Celsius since the pre-industrial times. Second, the greenhouse gas emissions in 2019 were about 12% higher than 2010 levels. Third, the 1.5 degree temperature limit has been scientifically arrived at since changes till this limit would be reversible in nature. Which of these given statements is or are correct? The correct answer to this question is actually A. One and two are correct and the third statement is wrong. The third statement, in fact, is the reason why a lot of scientists and people who are experts in this field have been criticizing leaders across the world. According to them, the 1.5 degree limit has been very conveniently set by leaders across the world without giving any attention to whether or not our planet will be able to handle these changes. There is no scientific evidence to suggest that within 1.5 degree limit we are safe and above that the problems will start. As per the experts, the problems have already started and even if we limit ourselves to an average increase of 1.5 degrees Celsius in the global temperature, there would still be a lot of problems. All this data that we are discussing is from this article of the Indian Express that is discussing the latest IPCC report. It says that there is very little chance to meet the target of 1.5 degrees Celsius that nations across the world have set at the Paris Climate Change Summit. In fact, for that to happen, the global greenhouse gas emissions must peak by 2025 and then decline by at least 43% by 2030, which will never happen because most of the countries are still increasing their greenhouse gas emissions. Also, the article says that there is no scientific limit that suggests that an increase of 1.5 degrees Celsius is fine for us. These are just arbitrary targets and no thought has been given to them. Next question number three. Hypersonic missiles are those that touch the speed of 3 Mach or more, 5 Mach or more, 7 Mach or more or 10 Mach or more. The correct answer here is B. Hypersonic are those missiles that can touch the speed of 5 Mach or more. Mach means the speed of sound. So any missile that goes five times the speed of sound or over that is considered as a hypersonic missile. The reason why we are discussing this is because of this article that there are concerns over China that has recently tested its hypersonic missile system. That is why AUKUS, that is Australia, UK and US are coming together to develop their own hypersonic missile system. 
The great part about hypersonic missiles is that these missiles are so fast that it is almost impossible to intercept these missiles. Nations such as US, Russia and China have already developed this technology. India is also one of those nations that is in the process of developing the hypersonic missile technology. Next question number four. Consider the following statements with regards to Export Credit Guarantee Corporation of India, also known as the ECGC. Number one. The ECGC Limited is wholly owned by the Government of India. Second, the ECGC was established to promote exports by providing credit insurance services to exporters against the non-payment risk by overseas buyers due to commercial or political reasons. Third, the ECGC also assists the exporters in recovering bad debt. Which of these given statements is or are correct? The correct answer again is D. All the three given statements here are correct. All these three are true about the Export Credit Guarantee Corporation of India. It is an organization made by the government of India to promote India's trade, to give an assurance to the exporters that when you give any product to any other country, be assured even if they are not able to pay back the money because of some political or economic reasons in their country, we will give you the reimbursement for that. It's kind of an insurance policy that is given to the exporters. ECGC also assists the exporters in recovery of the bad debt. The reason why we are discussing this is because Sri Lanka has been placed in the restricted cover category by the ECGC. That is, when ECGC gives certain insurance to the exporters, they have to see for which country are they giving the insurance. The countries that are at a higher risk of payment default are in the restricted category. A few days back, Russia was also put in the restricted category. Sri Lanka has been put in restricted cover category 1, that is RCC1. When a country enters the RCC1 category, that means the limits of insurance offered to the exporters are approved specifically on a case-to-case -case basis, which are normally valid for only one year. That is because the ECGC is taking a higher risk. However, the premium rates for such insurance remains the same. There is no change in that. The article also says that ECGC had recently put Russia in the restricted cover category from the earlier open cover category after its invasion of Ukraine and after US and EU slapped sanctions on Russia. For most of the nations, ECGC has not imposed any limit for covering political risk, but nations such as Sri Lanka and Russia are now under the RCC1 category. Next, we have a previous year question from 2020. With reference to the scholars or Literators of ancient India consider the following statements. Number one, Parini is associated with Pushya Mitra Shunga. Second, Amar Simha is associated with Harshwardhan. Third, Kalidas is associated with Chandragupt too. Which of these are correctly mentioned? The correct answer here is C. Only the third one is correctly matched. That is Kalidas is associated with Chandragupt too. While the first two are incorrect because they are from the different era. The correct answer here is C. Panini, who was a very famous Sanskrit grammarian, known as the person who laid down the rules for Sanskrit language, is said to have lived in the pre-Mauryan era. However, Pushamishung is a post-Mauryan king. So there are different eras to which these two people belong. Second, Amar Simha was one of the Navratnas of the Gupta era. And that is why, since Harshwadhan belongs to the post-Gupta era, the second statement also was wrong. The third statement is correct because Kalidas belonged to the court of Chandragupta Vikramaditya, also known as Vikramaditya II. And that is why only the third matching was correct. Next, we have a fact of the day and today we will be discussing about Government of Odisha's plan for landmark Lingaraj Temple. Now, Lingaraj, as you know, is one of the most well-known landmarks in the capital of Odisha, that is Bhubaneswar. This temple was first commissioned by King Jajati Keshri in the 10th century and was completed by King Lalatendu Keshri in the 11th century. It represents the best example of Kalinga style of architecture. The controversy regarding the temple goes back to December 2019 when the Odisha government announced a development plan for the temple and its peripheral area. This plan was supposed to involve an expenditure of about 700 crore rupees and would cover a 66 acre area. In the first phase of the project, the government thought of developing the outer access road, the Lingraj entry plaza, parking space, etc. Then in the year 2020, the Lingraj temple ordinance was brought to manage the rituals and other activities at the Lingraj temple and eight other associated temples. This was similar to an act that was introduced for the Jagannath temple in Puri. 
As per the ordinance, there would be a Lingraj Temple Managing Committee that would be formed, having a full-time administrator that would look into the day-to-day -day affairs of the temple. It would also create a fund to deposit any income that is made from the temple. This committee would control the 1500 acres of area in various places in the state because it belongs to multiple temples. But the problem started when this ordinance could not be cleared. This ordinance was forwarded to the president for his assent, but the president raised certain objections and sent it back. The Odisha government cleared those objections and sent it to the president of India again. However, the center government again sent this back and said that there are certain changes that they need in this particular law of the Odisha government. Now, what exactly is the point of view of the central government? The Union Home Ministry is saying that a lot of provisions of this ordinance are against the AMASR Act, that is, Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Sites and Remains Act of 1958, which says that the preservation of ancient and historical monuments and archaeological sites remains are under the central government. Thus, the ordinance that the Odisha government is passing is outside the competence of the state legislature. In very simple terms, the debate is that the central government is saying that ancient temples such as the Lingraj temple and the other temples of Odisha would be controlled and regulated and managed by the central government laws under the 1958 Act, while the Odisha government is saying that no, this comes under our state act. And that is why there has been this debate between the center and the state. Thus far, the Odisha government has not been able to get their ordinance passed because it requires a assent from the president. What happens in the coming days remains to be seen. This is it for today's video. Thank you so much for watching.